Hello everyone, I'm Jensen, your digital content producer. It is Thursday, August 20th, and I'm about to get you all caught up on today's top headlines. So we're gonna take a look at an update to a Wood County cold case, plus what the heck Governor Mike DeWine talked about in today's latest coronavirus press conference. But before we do any of that, I actually wanna get you updated on the latest coronavirus data. There were 1,122 new cases of coronavirus reported on Thursday, which is above the 21-day average of 1,066. Coronavirus-related deaths are hovering right at the average, with 22 reported on Thursday compared to 23. Hospitalizations were down, though, with 86 in the last 24-hour period. The 21-day average is 92 for that metric. And ICU admissions are sticking around the average as well. There were 17 new admissions reported today compared to that average of 15. Dwine also updated his list of counties in order of those with the most cases per 100,000 people to the least. Locally, Sandusky and Erie rank within the top 10. On Tuesday, Sandusky was in the number seven spot, but has since climbed to the sixth spot. This is Erie County's first instance in the top 10, coming in at nine. And Thursday brought an update to the state's public health advisory map. There are now only nine counties at level three red, which is the lowest since the system was first created. Locally, both Lucas and Erie counties remain in the red, although Lucas is teetering right on that edge of dropping to level two orange. Dwine reported Lucas had 102 cases per 100,000 people, which is just above the CDC threshold, but much lower than where they were two weeks ago, coming in at above 150. Erie County meets only two indicators, but it's still well above the CDC threshold with 129 cases per 100,000 people. The county saw 96 cases in just two weeks. And while Wood County remains in the level two orange, orange category, Dwine did mention a minor outbreak in the community stemming from a large sleepover. Uh, Wood County, uh, a sports team had a sleepover at a team member's house, and now there are nine confirmed cases. Um, just remind our athletes, uh, as we talked about on Tuesday, that what they do away from practice, what they do away from the from the competition is just vitally important. And according to our sports director, Jordan Strack, that eventually led back to Perrysburg High School. Now, school leaders are asking student athletes to eliminate any outside team activities that could further the spread of COVID-19. And we have all of that information ready for you on our website right now. Dwine today also announced that adult daycare centers and senior centers may open at a reduced capacity beginning on September 21st. And only as long as they meet certain health and safety guidelines, of course. Now, specific guidelines will be issued soon online, but Dwayne did give us a little bit of an insight into what these facilities should be considering right now. So, these facilities should look at case status in the surrounding community, the county's public health advisory level, the case status in its facility, the facility's staffing level, access to testing, the ability of participants to wear facial coverings, access to personal protective equipment, and local hospital capacity. Dwine also laid out a number of rules these facilities will have to follow, including limited capacity, limited entrance to the building to only those necessary to the safe operation of the program, screening participants and staff keeping a daily log, conduct baseline and repeat testing of staff and participants, require staff and participants to wear face coverings with minimal exceptions, use cohorting of participants when possible and alter schedules to reduce contact. And when that order is officially posted, we will of course make you aware of it so that you can go and read it over for yourself. And speaking of order, earlier this week, DeWine issued an order allowing both contact and non-contact sports to push ahead for the fall, but with some restrictions, of course. That order has now been released and it applies to all levels of athletics, from youth to collegiate to professionals. So let's take a quick look at what all is packed inside. So here are the requirements impacting players, coaches, trainers, and other officials. They should be conducting daily symptom checks keeping people with COVID-19 symptoms at home. Coaches are to undergo COVID-19 education developed for them by the Ohio Department of Health. No one can congregate before or after games or practices, including spectators. Coaches, trainers, volunteers, and officials must wear face coverings at all times. However, coaches and officials don't need to wear face coverings during games and practices, so people can hear the whistle whenever they use it. Players are to wear face coverings at all times, except when on the field of play. And players should be encouraged to wear face coverings at home to protect their family members who might be at a higher risk of developing complications from the virus. Now, 
Here are the rules for spectators, and of course, some of these overlap a bit. So they should be conducting daily symptom checks as well and staying home if they have COVID-19 symptoms. Families and household members are to sit together, socially distance from other individuals or family groups, and they shouldn't be congregating before or after games or practices. Spectators have to wear face coverings at all times unless they are exempt due to one of those reasons listed under the state's overall mask order. And it is recommended that in the context of youth sports that school and organization officials should prioritize ticket distribution and event access to the participants, family, and household members whenever possible. And since we're all trying to get outside, here's a bit of advice for you. The middle of August is known in Ohio as the start of ragweed season. Can you believe it's almost September? Crazy. Ragweed is one of the more popular weeds and the leading cause of allergies during the months of August and September. It can easily float through the air and land on your clothes or your pets. And other than taking antihistamines, there are a few easy ways to prevent pollen from lingering and causing your allergies to act up besides limiting outdoor time because who would want to do that when the weather is so nice. So Dr. Deng is an allergy specialist from Premier Allergy and Asthma, and he suggests closing the windows and running the AC a little bit more to filter the air. Another good idea is to shower at night to wash away any pollen that may have attached itself to your clothes or your hair during the day. And if you have pets, you'll want to give them a bit of a wash too, just to make sure nothing is sticking to their fur. But we're going to shift gears a little bit here to a pretty disturbing story spanning across the state. An Arizona man who authorities say has been linked by DNA to the slayings of four women at truck stops in Ohio and Illinois during the 1990s has been indicted for the rape and murder of a woman in Wood County back in 1996. The Wood County Prosecutor's Office said today that the 51-year-old Samuel Legg III has been connected with the murder of Victoria Jane Collins, whose nude body was found behind the Union 76 truck stop in Lake Township on December 20th, 1996, and she was just 27 years old. Legg's DNA was matched to the Collins murder and two other murders in Mahoning County, Ohio and Lake County, Illinois. And in addition to those first three cases where there has been a DNA link, Lake is facing rape charges for the 1997 sexual assault of a 17-year-old girl. And according to our sister station WKYC in Cleveland, there could be yet another case. Back in February of last year, Elyria police reopened a 30-year-old cold case that they say is connected to the former truck driver. And before I head out, let me give you a little bit of a sneak peek here. Tonight is the final night of the Democratic National Convention. Now, Kamala Harris has already formally accepted the Democratic nomination for vice president, making her the first black woman on a major party presidential ticket ever. And tonight, Joe Biden is expected to formally accept the Democratic nomination for president. And a few hours before, President Trump plans to stage an event at Biden's birthplace in Scranton, Pennsylvania. If you'd like to watch, we will have it streaming on our website, WTOL and on our Facebook page, of course, from 9 until 11 tonight. And next week kicks off the Republican National Convention, so get ready for coverage of that as well. But that is all I have for you today. For more on your top headlines, just watch us nightly on Channel 11 from 5, 6, and 11. And you can watch us right here Monday through Friday. Just like the video and hit subscribe so you'll get a little alert to your phone. And tomorrow, check in for a special edition of Afternoon Tea. We are diving into the Save the Children hashtag, and I'll break down exactly how you can get involved locally to help fight human trafficking. So if you're interested, make sure you have that alert ready so you know when I am hopping on here. But with all of that in mind, I hope you get out there and have a happy Thursday.